Now we cross over to our Oseong for Global Insight for an in-depth look at important developments in world affairs. Thanks very much for the intro, Mark. Uh, it is indeed time for Global Insight. The countdown begins tomorrow as South Korea will launch its first domestically developed space rocket on Thursday morning. And provided that the weather conditions are good, the Duri rocket should blast off at 4 p.m. from the Narrow Space Center in Kohung, South Chola province. If, if launched successfully, Korea will become the world's seventh country um, with homegrown rocket technology to launch a satellite over one ton into orbit. We're going to discuss how far the rocket program has come 11 years after it started and what we can look forward to until the year of 2030 when South Korea hopes to make a lunar landing. And for this, we connect with American space lawyer, Professor Michelle Hanlon. She is the co-founder and president of For All Moonkind and is also president of the National Space Society and co-director of the Center for Air and Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law. It's an honor to have you um, on our program, Professor Hanlon. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be here. And well, first of all, the Nuri rocket launching tomorrow, very exciting stuff. It's been an incredibly, um, there's been a lot of anticipation for this uh, for all South, among all South Koreans. But then when you look into the small print, though, it does say that um, developers expect a 30% success rate uh, from this launch. And to be honest, that doesn't sound like there's much to celebrate. So what really is the significance of this launch and what would mark it as success? So what's really important to remember is that you don't have success without failure, right? So you need to understand, you need to build that in. Um, for every success, you've had just monumental amounts of failure. So for South Korea, this is an incredible opportunity to, uh, and I think it's going to be successful, but if, if for some reason it's not, it's an incredible opportunity to learn, to learn about your own technology, to learn about your own mistakes, to make your own mistakes and to own those mistakes. Anything that happens tomorrow, um, success or failure, there's going to be so much data and information that the researchers and scientists and engineers receive from that launch that they will be able to improve future rockets by their other uh, efficiency, weight capacity, um, cost. This is this is such a great um, moment in time for the space agency because you really you have the entire nothing can be nothing can go wrong because you're going to learn so much from this launch regardless. And Professor Hanlon, if South Korea does successfully launch the Nuri rocket, then of course it's going to become the seventh country in the world with the ability to launch a uh, rocket using uh, indigenous technologies. What does it mean for a country to have this um, independent capability to launch satellites into orbit? So it's so important to remember how important space is to our daily lives, right? Everything we do is somehow touched by space whether it's on our phone, our GPS system, uh, telecommunications, um, getting satellite data in order to know if a river is going to flood, um, what, what the river flow looks like. And so South Korea is building for itself this opportunity to um, launch these kinds of technologies and these satellites on its own timetable and on its own terms. So no more do you, will you have to wait in line perhaps for a SpaceX launch or an Ariane launch no, you can build your launch, you can build your payload to fit your rocket, you can um, retrofit your rocket so that your payload fits better. You know, you are, you are your own best customer, you are your only customer, and your launch vehicles will cater to what you need as a country. And of course, also think about national security and things like, uh, and, and safety. And so you are gonna be able to launch things without having to disclose um, perhaps confidential or secret or very sensitive information about that payload or about that particular launch or about that particular orbit. Now we do talk in space about being as transparent as possible because we all know, you know Korea, South Korea is a, a party to the Outer Space Treaty. The Outer Space Treaty is very clear. It's, it's customary international law that um, uh, space is to be used only solely for peaceful purposes. Um, and that the freedom and exploration of use is open to all without discrimination. So this is what, you, what you're building, what you've built with this rocket is the flexibility and the capability essentially to go to space and put those assets, whatever assets in space you want, um, when you need them. And of course, there are going to be uh, 
other launches that follow the one that happens on Thursday. But after the Nuri rocket is tested this week, then what would be the next step for developers? So the, what's really exciting is you are just opening the entire universe up to South Korea with this rocket, right? Because from here, you are going to be able to build more and more efficient and uh, rockets. Your, your launch costs are going to go down. You're going to, uh, I read that you are, the government is talking about um, sharing this information and eventually privatizing this information. So it's a it's such a smart move by South Korea because space is the future. And so what the what this signals is that you are building not just the capability to go to space, you are building a new economy based on space, which is the future. If we look around the world, we look at co uh, countries like Luxembourg and UAE. They are transitioning Luxembourg from finance to a space economy, UAE from oil to a space economy. Um, just like South Korea is now looking to the future um, for to support the South Korean people, to support the South Korean economy, to support the South Korean state, because we know that everything, whether it's asteroid mining or space solar power, getting energy from space and reducing our energy costs, space imaging data, the, the possibilities of what space has to offer are as endless and, and universal and infinite as space itself. And so this is when you look at this launch, again, what, what, whatever happens, um, you are on this first step to a, a bursting economy with so many possibilities for the, for the um, citizens of South Korea. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it, it, makes me, um, it makes me giddy. And it certainly is very exciting to hear about all these, well, what seem like infinite opportunities and the uh, potential of space technology. But South Korea is, of course, um, it's aiming to reach the moon by 2030 as uh, the one uh, major step. How feasible do you think this vision is? And what are you looking forward to seeing over the next 10 years? So I'm going to play the optimist. I think you, uh, South Korea will be on the moon in 2030. Um, there are a lot of people going back to the moon. What I see within the next decade are a lot of uh, robotic and also crude missions to the moon. I, you know, right, you know we're in, in a sort of mini, uh, I don't want to call it space race, but there's uh, a competition. We have the United States and its partners um, planning a mission under what they call the Artemis Accords. Um, we have China and Russia planning a mission under what, um, uh, and just sort of to a moon base. Of course, South Korea is a member of the Artemis Accords. It has signed those accords with the United States. And so that is a big boost in, or in terms of helping South Korea get to the moon because we're talking about transparency. We're talking about standardization. We're talking about collaborations where we don't have to um, reinvent things from one mission to the other. Um, South Korea is going to be able to work with Artemis partners to share knowledge and technology. And that's another reason I think they're gonna get, you are gonna get to the moon by 2030. I'm really, in the next decade, I'm really looking to see um, the moon really honestly being treated like the, like the Earth's next continent. Um, and I don't mean exploiting, I mean exploring. You know, there are a lot of secrets on the moon that we don't know about. Is there water on the moon? Are there, is there, um, it, well, we know there's water on the moon. How much is on the moon? Where is it? How can we mine it? How can we harness the resources of the moon to assist ourselves on Earth? But more important, you know, the moon is very close. And so much like um, South Korea has this new launch, this baby set step into space, um, the moon is a baby step to the universe. We need, to, we want someplace close by to be able to test things so that we can go to Mars and so that we can go to other asteroids. Um, and so we're going to use the moon responsibly as a testing ground. And again, South Korea is a member of those Artemis Accords, and they talk about the responsible exploration of the moon and the re responsible um, use of the resources and the sustainable use of the resources. So it's really exciting to see um, South Korea in particular being able to harness these partnerships and collaborations and contribute to that responsibility. We don't want to um, enter an era of uh, using, using things up. We are looking at exploring space very differently from the way our forefathers and foremothers um, explored the Earth. And again, it's, I think South Korea is poised to really take advantage of that.
Right, and we're, as you said, we're looking forward to more collaboration between South Korea and the United States as well as uh, the world takes these, as you said, baby steps into the wider universe. And well, we're seeing more and more commercial ventures into space. And there's that one question that everyone asks, of course. Um, I'm sure you get this quite a lot. Um, when is space travel going to become available or affordable for the average Joe? So I wish, or Jill, average Jill here, um, I wish I knew the answer to that. I will say, I, um, I thank everybody who is paying $250,000 for their ticket to go to space. I thank um, Jeff Bezos and uh, Elon Musk and Richard Branson every day for um, putting their personal fortunes into space. Because if we think about our history on Earth, you know, when, when the first car automobiles were built, um, it took a while for them to become common um, and affordable to, the norm to normal Jills and Joes. Um, and so I, I, would like to, I would like to say, that um, I will be able to afford to go into space within my lifetime. I am I'm in my, in my 50s, so I, I think we're looking at about 20 years. The, what's really fantastic is um, because countries like South Korea are able to exhibit and demonstrate this technology, and I think the more and more launches we get, whether it's commercial or from a government standpoint, um, the cheaper and cheaper it's going to become because every time we launch, and again, whether it's a success successful launch or not, however you however you um, peg it, every launch is, is successful because every launch helps us reduce the cost of the next launch, which means those ticket prices go down. Well, we had so many more questions to ask you, Professor Hannan, but I'm afraid this is all the time we have. We hope we can speak with you again in the future. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you so much for having me again, and, and uh, I will be watching with bated breath. Thank you. Thank you.